1840s. Andre Chikatilo's parents tell him that an older brother has been murdered and cannibalized during a famine. Chikatilo begins fantasizing about killing and eating people. His fantasies of consuming human flesh continue into adulthood. He finally succumbs to his desire. From 1978 to 1990, Chikatilo murders, mutilates, and in some cases cannibalizes 52 women and children. It is considered the most brutal crime spree in Soviet history. On February 15, 1994, Chikatilo is executed for his crimes. For the sheer volume of his atrocities and the brutality with which they were committed, Dr. Stone places Andre Chikatilo at number 22, the highest number on his scale. A troubling childhood memory, mental illness, these are some of the ingredients which may have driven Andre Chikatilo to murder and consume his victims. But the triggers of all cannibals are not as clear cut. Experts wonder what drove Jeffrey Dahmer, America's most notorious cannibal. Does his murderous spree have roots in the dissolution of his family? Are memories of profound loneliness part of what drive him to kill? Milwaukee, 1978. At age 17, Dahmer's parents engage in a bitter divorce. Dahmer is left to live at home alone. Later that year, Dahmer picks up a hitchhiker and murders him. I didn't want him to leave, he later explains. From 1978 to 1991, Dahmer's spree continues. He rapes, murders, and eats at least 15 men and boys. In some cases, he stores their remains in his refrigerator. By 1991, it is estimated that he is killing one person a week. It is not until one of his intended victims is able to escape that police discover the gruesome scene at Dahmer's apartment. Investigators uncover human remains, severed heads, and bodies decomposing in containers of acid. His total number of victims is unknown. Dahmer is sentenced to 937 years behind bars. After two years in prison, Dahmer is murdered by a fellow inmate. Dr. Stone reserves the highest place on his scale for Jeffrey Dahmer, for his elaborate and vicious acts of torture, rape, and murder. Like Andre Chikatilo, Jeffrey Dahmer receives a 22 on Dr. Stone's scale. Sacramento, 1978. A pregnant woman is savagely murdered in her home. Blood is drained from her body. One month later, three more people are discovered in a small home. Again, the bodies have been drained of blood. In some cases, organs are missing. There were so many murders in this case. They were so violent and gruesome. Police quickly pin the crimes on 27-year-old Richard Chase. He confesses to the crimes and tells investigators he had to do it. He believes he must drink the blood of others or he will die. His motive for murder? To quench a delusional thirst for blood. To the general public, the actions of Richard Chase look like those of a madman. But in his delusional state, he has convinced himself that murder and consuming blood are a very matter of survival. To understand how he becomes so intertwined with his delusion, I must explore his past. May 23, 1950. Richard Chase is born into an unhappy home in a middle-class neighborhood of Sacramento. 
His father is a disciplinarian, and his mother suffers from delusions. She accuses her husband of infidelity and spends hours crying. Both parents take their frustrations out on a young Richard. Chase's mother forces him to eat until he becomes violently ill. Richard begins acting out. He starts torturing and mutilating animals. He dismembers their bodies and buries the remains in the backyard. Chase shows extreme signs of pathological behavior at an early age. His blatant abuse of animals is a key indication of a deep-rooted mental disturbance. His actions as a child are a precursor to extreme violent behavior in adulthood. As an adult, Chase starts showing signs of mental illness. He abuses drugs, pushing him further into his delusions. He becomes deeply paranoid and believes people are out to harm him. Chase boards up the windows and doors of his apartment. He sees numerous psychiatrists without result. With no help in sight, Chase slowly spirals deeper into his isolated world of delusion and fantasy. Chase becomes convinced that he is being poisoned by both his mother and the Nazis. He believes the poison is dissolving the blood in his body. He begins to slaughter animals and drink their blood in order to replenish his own blood. It is a delusional attempt to sustain his own life. Fearing he will die, Chase injects rabbit's blood into his veins. He is admitted into a hospital. Doctors diagnose Chase as having schizophrenia and suffering from somatic delusions. Somatic delusions focus on distortions relating to body functions, sensations, or one's physical appearance. Usually, these amount to the false belief that the sufferer is somehow diseased, abnormal, or changed. As for Richard Chase, he believes that he has been poisoned and that his blood is evaporating. Less than six months later, Chase is released. Hospital psychologists believe he is no longer a danger to himself or the community. Within days of returning home, neighbors observe Chase bringing animals into his apartment. They are never seen again. Dissecting creatures and liquefying their organs no longer alleviates Chase's bloodlust. Even some hospital employees who treated and released Chase knew what he was capable of in his search for blood. My belief was that Richard Chase now was doing things with small animals, you know, killing them, drinking their blood, and that he would graduate to larger animals and eventually to people. Among Richard Chase's delusions are voices telling him he is diseased. He is convinced Nazis are poisoning him and that his blood is dissolving. He must consume blood in order to survive. The depth of Chase's delusions, fueled by his abuse of mind-altering drugs, shows how wildly his schizophrenia-like illness had spiraled out of control. The delusions invaded every aspect of his life. Once he began to abuse the drugs, the swiftness of his mental deterioration accelerates like a runaway train. But after consuming the blood and organs of animals, his delusions persist. Chase begins hunting for new sources of blood. Chase trolls neighborhoods, looking for his first human kill. December 29th, 1977. Without warning, Chase guns down a man in his front yard. Chase flees, unable to drink his victim's blood. Police do not link him to the murder until later. 
With voices compelling him to drink blood, Chase continues to prowl Sacramento, searching for more victims. One month later, police discover a gruesome scene. Three mutilated bodies are discovered in a small Sacramento home within the vicinity of Chase's apartment. One victim is savagely dissected and drained of her blood. She also suffers a series of violent sexual assaults before and after her death. The grisly nature of the crime shocks even veteran officers. The FBI creates a profile, white male in his mid-twenties, thin and undernourished. Police immediately receive several tips implicating Chase. Richard Chase is arrested. Chase is charged with six murders. The brutal nature of the crimes and the disturbing element of vampirism draws media outlets from across California. After several psychiatric reviews, Chase is found sane. While doctors believe schizophrenia fueled his delusions, the court determines that Chase could distinguish right from wrong. After a four-month trial, Chase is found guilty of six counts of first-degree murder. He is sentenced to death. Chase's mental illness, one that resembled paranoid schizophrenia, led me to place him originally at level 13. But taking into consideration the violent sexual nature of his crimes, which probably would not have occurred but for the drug abuse, lead me to place him at a higher level, 17. After less than a year in prison, Chase commits suicide by hoarding a lethal dose of his psychotherapeutic medication. Though Richard Chase was diagnosed as a schizophrenic, he didn't stay on his medication. His delusions go unchecked, delusions which are frighteningly real. There's no question that to the person experiencing delusions, they are real. Dr. Robert McCarley, director of the Neuroscience Laboratory of the Harvard Medical School, is trying to better understand the brains of schizophrenics. He hopes to learn how to better treat those whose delusions lead them to harm themselves or others. Why do some patients become violent? Certainly not a majority or even a, a major part of the people with schizophrenia. If your brain is disordered enough to think that people are out pursuing you, then it seems reasonable all the way logical for you to strike out at those people. The majority of patients with schizophrenia are not violent, but in a few rare cases, like that of Richard Chase, their delusions can drive them to violent acts. What can science tell us about schizophrenic delusions? To better understand the mind of schizophrenics and determine why some have delusions that lead to violence, Dr. McCarley conducts an electrophysiological examination of the brain. Subject comes in, they put a cap on his head, which has 64 electrodes on it, and then we present stimuli to the subjects. The patient has played a series of tones. Some of the tones are different than the others. The participant is asked to identify the oddball or different tones by responding with a mouse click. The subject's brain on its own generates electrical potentials, brain waves that make up the EEG. Dr. McCarley has determined that the schizophrenic brain has a harder time distinguishing the different tones. The patient's brain waves also show that there is a specific area of the brain that processes these sounds. One of the brain areas that's affected in schizophrenia is in the temporal lobe, and this is one of the main areas for processing language and for processing auditory information. According to Dr. McCarley's research, the temporal lobe may be the source of auditory hallucinations. The patient's own mind creates the delusions and hallucinations. 
But why can some delusions